really fast tracking National Assembly legislations. When they are brought, whew, we put them through the conveyor belt so fast, and most of us don't even understand them. While our own bills originated from this house, they are collecting dust at the National Assembly. In fact, if you read this bill, Mr. Speaker, you'll get to a point where the National Assembly is given so much powers as a reporting agency. I'll try and look at certain provisions of this bill, which I think the drafters of this bill have thought about, but not really. But they need to expand it. And I really do hope that this time around, distinguished senators can get an opportunity to really internalize this bill. We don't want to be counted as those people who go in and clap for a bill and they don't even know what it is about. They haven't read. So that tomorrow when it is affecting us, we start complaining. Mr. Speaker, when you are told that when you're, in a, when you're a public figure or a state officer, that you've got to disclose all your money that you earn, the money that your wife earns, the money that your children earn, the money, I mean, seriously, what sort of draconian laws are these, Mr. Speaker? You'll find families that the husband and the wife, they don't talk to each other. They just live in an arrangement. They collect. They make their own money. But now, if you are a state officer, you are now asked, Mr. Speaker, imagine this, that that wife of yours that you don't talk to, that child of yours that you don't talk to, who has her life or his life, for you as a state officer, you must disclose how much money they, they earn. You must disclose all their income. I mean, seriously? Just because we want to please the World Bank, we just really come up with legislation that don't help us? I long for the time, Mr. Speaker, when we as a country can be able to develop our legislation, taking into consideration our culture, how people struggle to be there. You know, if you, if you read the people who are tasked with the administration of this conflict of interest legislation. Number five, we say the act shall be administered by reporting authorities. And I'll define who those reporting authorities are. And the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. Mr. Speaker, why should we not just look at the ESCC Act, go through it together, see what we can change? Because no law is static. Things change. We're very good as a country, Mr. Speaker, in drafting legislation. We are very good. We pass them, but they are only good on paper. There's one section which is very utopian in its nature. It says, still on the number six, the function of the commission under this act shall be 6B develop an effective system of reporting violations of this act. So the ESCC goes out and develop a reporting mechanism. And then below in number seven, it says the commission shall in performance of its function under this act have the powers to, number one, conduct investigation on its own initiative or on a complaint made by a member of the public. I wish it went further and say that what are the requirements? Once you complain, how are you sort of like putting the no on the entire investigating mechanism? When is it reported back to you? Because you made a complaint. You are a consumer of this bill. You've complained to the commission. How does the commission write back to you? We need, because I know this is going to pass, we need to be able to expand that section and amend that section, Mr. Speaker. There's a provision which I think is very dangerous, and all of us must really pay attention to it. Still, number seven, it says, delegate to another person or body by notice in the Gazette any of its powers or functions under this act in respect to 
classes of public officers specified by the commission and that persons of the body shall be deemed to be responsible for the administration and management of conflict of interest. Mr. Speaker, that's a very, very dangerous clause. We're already seeing what is panning out there. If you read at 156 of the Constitution of Kenya, where it gives the powers to protect public interest to the Attorney General. And then the same, when you go to the Attorney General's Act, you will see that he is now given the powers to delegate. And in most cases, he will delegate to the Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, a very mischievous government will then bypass the Attorney General and goes to the Solicitor General. Because the Act gives that person the power to delegate. Who is this person who the Commission shall delegate their powers to? If we've set up a Commission which is set up under an Act of Parliament, why then not either amend that Act of Parliament or do away? Mr. Speaker, I would propose that this very dangerous clause should be deleted so that the independence of a body and everybody out there will not be confused on the powers of that commission. Allow that commission to perform its function, but not restrictively, but not now create room for it to be abused by setting up another agency that is delegated powers. Because, hypothetically, Mr. Speaker, if the powers that be are not happy with the independence of the commission, then they will just go to the other person who is delegated. It creates room for corruption, which is what we are trying to deal with here, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if you read 7, the commission shall, in performance of its function under this act, have the powers to, D says, cooperate and collaborate with any public entity or agencies, any foreign government, an international or, or regional organization in the management of conflict of interest and, I proceed, enforcement of this act. Mr. Speaker, what is it that we do in this house? We've got two, and hopefully soon we'll get a third, uh, a third committee on oversight. We've got the public accounts committee, We've got the PIC committee, Public Investments uh, Accounts Committee. I would have hoped that now that you're trying to really deal with the issue of corruption, incorporate the aspect of these two committees to be able to work there. So leaving out the Senate, yet sometimes we have these ESCC people there sitting with us in our, in our committees. Why then not say, in this aspect that even the Senate, so that you can deal with the corruption in the counties, Mr. Speaker. You know, and uh, later on, I hope we'll have time, I don't know if we'll have time, that I'll be moving my motion on pending of bills. But if you really want to deal with the matter decisively, then you've got to create room for this oversight house to be able to work directly with the commission to punish these governors, to punish these people who are stealing all this money that belongs to the public. In my view, Mr. Speaker, I hold the view that this is not an act that has been thought out clearly. It is an act, it is a bill which is being rushed to be able to <laughs> please other agencies like the World Bank. Mr. Speaker, if you read section 13, which I, I don't know whether it's the one that you're saying we're going to amend, it says that a public officer shall not directly or indirectly use or allow any person under the office authority to use any information that is obtained in the course of performing official duties and is not available to the public to improperly further or seek a further. You had actually, I was looking at it and I said, they should limit it to strictly private and personal interest. You know, when I, when I was born, uh, Mr. Speaker, oh.
speaker, you can give me some additional time. Because this is something that I really, really believe that we need to be very diligent. We need to take our time. So what I was saying is that on that section 13, it is imperative that it is limited to an individual. You know, my brother has got no business dealing with my issues. Number 19, Mr. Speaker, a public officer shall not be a party to or beneficial of a contract for the supply of good works of services with his or her reporting entity. Mr. Speaker, I think it is wrong to deny Kenyans an opportunity to be able to perform certain functions. If, Mr. Speaker, hypothetically, Mr. Speaker, you own a company that trades with the Senate, and that company has been trading with the Senate, it doesn't say that Wakili Sigei, Senator of Bomet, is trading with that. Mr. Speaker, I just, be, I just want us to really put this thing into perspective. It should only be limited to an individual. If it is coming under your name, by all means, I agree you shouldn't do, you shouldn't benefit. But if it is your company, so this issue of indirectly, Mr. Speaker, that ought to be removed. And I, I can dare say, Mr. Speaker, if you go to these developed countries, you will not find such draconian laws. They are so quick to impose them on us, but they don't have them. Mr. Speaker, I'm a firm believer that Section 27 ought to be deleted completely in its entirety. I know the committee was probably recommending for it to be amended, but in my own reading of this bill, where it says, a former public officer shall not, and I'll read A, B, C, and D briefly, act for or on behalf of any person in connection with any specific proceeding, transaction, negotiated, negotiation, or case in which the state is a party and with respect to which the former public officer had acted for or provided advice to the state. Mr. Speaker, the word former means I no longer benefit from it. In fact, if we are clever enough, Mr. Speaker, former staff have got historical memory. In fact, they will better advise someone because they can easily save the public money. In other jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker, former officers set up offices to offer consultancy services. In the United States, Mr. Speaker, former IRS officers who are working with the Internal Revenue Service set up consultancy services and they will tell you, I was a former officer of the Internal Revenue Service. They help you be able to save your time. They help you negotiate better. Mr. Speaker, this Section 27, I believe, has to be deleted. Section 28, Mr. Speaker, is such other provision that I believe ought to be deleted, where it says a former public official shall not during the period of two years. Why are you incarcerating me? Why are you making it difficult for me to make a life? Suppose that is the only training that I've had. So for two years, I'll stay hungry just because I happen to have been working in that department. Mr. Speaker, this is draconian and it has to be removed. Mr. Speaker, because of time, I will set other provisions which I think are very problematic. Section 31. Every public officer shall submit to the responsible commission a declaration of his or her income, assets, and liability, and the income, assets, and liability of his or her spouse and dependent children. That is ridiculous. Dependent children. Yes, they depend on me. But the fact that they are dependent means they don't own, they don't own anything. And if I'm paying for them their college, and maybe they go to college and get a job as a waiter. Now I have to follow my child and say, I need to know how much money you are making as a waiter because there's this ridiculous draconian law that we passed that requires me as a public officer to declare how much you are being paid as a waiter. That is ridiculous. Mr. Speaker, I want to request two more minutes I, I conclude this matter. Mr. Speaker, if you look at 31A, where 
you have two more minutes. Two more minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Where the National Assembly is given so much powers. You know, it says that the Committee of the National Assembly, responsible for the ethics of members, is responsible commission for the Cabinet, members of the National Assembly, the DPP, the Secretary to the Cabinet. Mr. Speaker, I propose that that section be amended to state as Parliament, which is both houses of Parliament. It is important and I'm happy that uh, we have our powers and privileges committees that deals with the ethics of our committees. But I think even in terms of the National Assembly, it ought to be reduced to that on its own. Mr. Speaker, is another very dangerous provision, which is 32.3. A public officer shall within 30 days after ceasing to be a public officer submit a final declaration relating to his financial affairs as of the date he ceased to be a public officer. Mr. Speaker, we have members of parliament who spend a lot of money and running for re-election. At the time when they were running, they had so much money. But they lose, unfortunately. So you want to embarrass that person that after 30 days, he comes in and tells you I'm now bankrupt? Come on, where is level of uh, respect and privacy to these things. You already, you know he's no longer in, in office. I still also believe that section 34, Mr. Speaker, has also got to be repealed. I, will, I invite uh, members of uh, the Senate to go read through that. The other one which, Mr. Speaker, is very dangerous is 39. If you read 39, 2A, Mr. Speaker, it says, a reporting authority and the commission shall not conduct concurrent investigation over the same complaint. Mr. Speaker, we are two distinct houses. There is Take it to public participation, just like the way the National Assembly does, is because we are two independent institutions that gives different opinions. That means now, if the Energy Committee of the National Assembly is seized of a matter of high, you know, bills, electric bill, it means that this, the, the, the Senate Energy Committee will not be investigating that matter. That is an issue that needs to be taken off. Mr. Speaker, I really wish we had so much time, but I want to end by saying the following. Yes, we may want to appear as if we are compliant to the terms of what I call modern structural adjustment policies. But I think we have to look at our situation. We need to look at our, our situation. Mr. Speaker, I will instruct my office to draft amendments, to submit those amendments. Whether they pass or not, the time when this bill will be punitive, when it will be hurting people, is when people will say, I wish I knew and I wish I listened. Mr. Speaker, I wish I had more time, but I don't. But I want to send this message that let us look at our situation here. Let us create legislation that feeds our interest, but not the interest of Bretton Woods institutions. Mr. Speaker, I reserve my comment on whether I support or do not support, but I think my submissions really leads to one, uh, one conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Honorable Senators, that brings us to the end of uh, members who are contributing to the bill. And I call upon the mover of this bill to reply. Give the Majority Leader the microphone. Proceed, uh, Majority Leader. I have a mic now, I believe. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank... Uh, colleagues who have taken time to respond and uh, share their thoughts on this bill. They are as far and wide as you can imagine in a house of 67 legislators. Some agree, others disagree, and that is the essence of democracy, Mr. Speaker. Senator Ledama Olekina has gone into the length and the depth of this uh, bill. Uh, it made me very curious to know what business is this that he's doing, which he doesn't want uh, many other people to know. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and yet I know him to be 
just a humble farmer, uh, Mr. Speaker, who goes about his dues, his business in a honest way. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are very useful insights that have come from our colleagues uh, listening through the presentation from you as a chair of the committee, and I've had the opportunity to read through what you have proposed actually as a committee of justice and legal affairs, various amendments, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but curiously, uh, like Ledama says, and it's something which I want to encourage any chairperson of, the com of any committee, and this is a trick that we have used as a house over the years, which unfortunately some of our chairpersons uh, are yet to appreciate, uh, Mr. Speaker, and this is something you need to do. You know, Mr. Speaker, there's this story of the camel and the uh, tent. The camel only asked to be allowed uh, to just have its head shelter because of the sweltering heat of the desert. But before long, Mr. Speaker, it had its whole body inside the tent by pushing in small by small. That is a policy that we adopted as a Senate a long time ago. That each time we have legislation before us, anything, anything that states National Assembly does this, we simply always replace by Parliament. And I don't know why uh, committee chairpersons don't do this. I don't know why our staffers, uh, the legal affairs and the, uh, what is it called, the, the clerks of these committees forget this golden rule, which is something we have done over the years and we have gained. Because many other times, it will take time for the organs and the instruments of government to appreciate that we have gone by Cameroon. It is now 14 years, uh, Mr. Speaker, since 2010, or if you remove the two years before the election of 2012, then it's now 12 years, Mr. Speaker, into a bicameral system of parliament. Yet when you get bills, so long as they have come, from the uh, government printer and the office of the uh, Attorney General, Mr. Speaker, then 90% of the time, even on matters that the Constitution has uh, specified that this is something that is to be handled by Parliament, chances are they'll just write National Assembly. Uh, and sometimes I don't know whether it's uh, mischievous on their part or it's just a part of lazy drafting. Uh, Mr. Speaker, because many are yet. Of course, I want to believe that this is an effort of copy-pasting uh, Mr. Speaker, most of the time, because you know how people work in this country. Uh, before the long, before the days of chat GDP, uh, uh, chat GP, Mr. Speaker, they were uh, copy paste as a way of doing your assignments and carrying out your responsibilities. Therefore, you'll find that uh, the drafters that handle many of these bills that come from outside uh, the prestige of Parliament, Mr. Speaker, they would simply copy on any provisions. And where there is parliament, they're likely to put National Assembly. Many are yet to appreciate, Mr. Speaker, that those two uh, names are not synonymous anymore, like was the case before 2010, uh, Mr. Speaker, that they are distinctly different. And I want to encourage uh, our drafters, both our members of the various committees and the chairpersons and even uh, members of staff who work with our committees, that so long as it's not a constitutional provision, and this will only be limited to money bills, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and even that we will get to slowly by slowly, uh, Mr. Speaker, eventually. Always, when there is any provision, if it is being stated like uh, Senator Ledama was pointing out on the, uh, the committee that is being set up, that the National Assembly Committee is responsible for this, the obvious amendment that I expect was a deletion of that clause and in putting it with Parliament. It makes it uh, plain and simple and, and people appreciate and move away uh, from this. Senator uh, Crystal Asiga did mention something which I totally agree with it on the overall objective of this bill, Mr. Speaker. It is not for want of good laws that we continue to struggle with the challenge of corruption and conflict of interest and all these things, uh, Mr. Speaker. We have a values problem and that is a challenge. People are not corrupt because there is lack of good legislation, Mr. Speaker, that there is no enforcement, and so on and, and so forth. But it is because, as a society, we have accepted that to be a way of life. Everybody just wants to cut shortcut. Everybody wants to be bribed. Everybody wants to make a quick buck out of whatever situation. From voters to politicians to members of uh, uh, private sector and anyone, uh, Mr. Speaker. There are very few people, uh, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, in this country who can stand and say no and just do the right thing. 
and all these legislations that we consider here in Parliament, and all these reports, and all these offices that we created in the 2010 Constitution, until we begin to appreciate that corruption is a values problem, Mr. Speaker, and begin to teach it from our young age in our school system so that it is inbuilt in the culture of the younger generation, Mr. Speaker, because unfortunately, there's very little that you can do, uh, Mr. Speaker, with people once they have clocked the age of 18 or even sometimes lesser than that. If they have accepted that this is the way of life, Mr. Speaker, there's very little. You can only deter, which is what this legislation do. It is with the threat of going to jail, the threat of being exposed, Mr. Speaker, that you limit people. But if you want to live in a country where people observe, people have discipline, uh, Mr. Speaker, people obey traffic rules, uh, Mr. Speaker, then we must begin to teach this practice and this culture from our ch uh, children at a very young age. Because unfortunately, there is very little that the rest of all of us in this uh, parliament today and in this room, all of us that are adults already, there are very little habits that we can pick up late in life and begin to accept as a way of life, which is, is a fact of life, uh, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, I want to, uh, as much as I agree with Senator Crystal that corruption is a values uh, problem, which you have to do, then we don't have a choice. We cannot simply sit pretty on our laurels and say, oh, so long as uh, that's how Kenyans are, that's how the world is, what do we do? The countries that have succeeded in limiting all these vices and societal ills, uh, Mr. Speaker, it is on account of laws such as this, where the threat, Mr. Speaker, of being exposed, the threat of going to jail, the threat of losing ill-acquired wealth, Mr. Speaker, makes you hold back because that is human nature. People, so long as they know that there is a risk in doing certain practices, Mr. Speaker, then long after all this is said and done, Mr. Speaker, at least somebody will reflect at night and think through and say, my goodness, if I do this, what is going to happen? And I hope one day, Mr. Speaker, we can have a conversation with the Chief Justice and the Judiciary General, because I have a strong feeling, Mr. Speaker, that that circuit is yet to be complete. I know that previously at the Bombers of Kenya, there was a conference, Mr. Speaker. If you remember the infamous conference where former President Uhuru quipped, what do you want me to do? That was a conference that had brought together all the instruments that are involved and all the state agencies that are involved in this fight against corruption. You had the ODPP there, you had ESEC, you had the DCI, you had the judiciary and uh, the legislature. I'm not sure if they were uh, represented at that particular conference, Mr. Speaker, because we must also begin to ask very difficult questions of our judiciary. How can they keep on coming back to us and tell us that, oh, it is on account of poor investigation, is because the case are not properly handled, that the conviction rate is so minimal, Mr. Speaker? How comes it is so difficult to nab uh, these people that are engaged in these vices? Yet eventually, we know that at the end of the day, those, those courts in the little uh, magistrate courts and the high courts, Mr. Speaker, these cases drag on forever. I was watching news today, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I was shocked that from the 2013 case of that imposter of a police uh, officer, I think it was called uh, Waiganjo, that today actually the High Court dismissed that case. Somebody that even a kindergarten kid knows in this country that this was an imposter. They, he was exposed. He was in police uniform. He was doing police duties. Police officers confessed. But a judge dismissed the case, Mr. Speaker. And so long as, and you know, the greatest disservice we ever did to ourselves, Mr. Speaker. And this is a question that one day the judiciary in the passage of the 2010 Constitution succeeded to insulate themselves against any form of scrutiny, Mr. Speaker. That so long as a judge knows that whatever decision they make in the course of their duty, there is nothing that can be done to them, uh, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to have this kind of struggle. We must ask of our judiciary, with all these billions that you continue to send, uh, to the judicial systems of this country. How comes the conviction rate are so minimal, Mr. Speaker? If you say it's a case of investigation, poor investigation, surely you want to tell me that there is not even one uh, good investigator, that there is no one good case that ESEC has handled that a judge can look at and say this is an open shut case, call all the witnesses, have the responses filed, and set a conviction, uh, Mr. Speaker, so that we know even this simple... Uh, traffic offenses, for example, Mr. Speaker, 
you have watched many times ESCC raid police officers on the, by the roadside. If you want to kill that vice, how comes after that expose, you will never hear of that case again once they have been taken to court, uh, to court Mr. Speaker? It's because people know what happens, that the judges will most likely tell you, wait for the pressure to ease off. They are likely to be out on bail. Then after maybe a few months, somebody reaches out to the judge from the accused side and say, okay, you know you are guilty, but if you can get me this, we must speak about these issues, Mr. Speaker. Because eventually, if we are to win this war and have a country that is governed by the rule of law, uh, Mr. Speaker, we must be able to look at our judges right in the eye and tell them, you guys are doing a disservice to this country. Your handling of corruption cases is wanting. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, as we reflect and do this particular law, the conflict of interest bill, and it's good because... Uh, judges are also state officers, Mr. Speaker. That we will, they will also equally file their reports. And it will be possible to look back and tell what is it that you have done? What business have you transacted? Because unfortunately, people know corruption in this country only through the eyes of politicians. They only see members of parliament and maybe cabinet ministers. Yet, Mr. Speaker, to complete this cycle, we mean this circuit actually we must have a conversation about what is it that we missed in our judicial system mr speaker that will eventually help us find people how many times have you seen dci officers or ESCC officers raid a particular county office a chief officer or a cec found with money that they have collected as bribes mr speaker yet you know that case will never get anywhere so mr speaker i want to encourage colleagues much as you may have one or two reservations about this particular bill and the overall thought process of trying to um, uh, tighten the reins and tighten the news around all these challenges that we have with our country, Mr. Speaker, and trying to make us a, a better nation, a nation that is governed by good values, Mr. Speaker, let us support this bill. Propose amendments, as Senator Ledama has said, Make it better. Make it work for everybody. In fact, tighten it even around judges, uh, Mr. Speaker. We want to put it in law so that they go and strike it again in court so that then eventually the people of Kenya can know the challenges that we are having with our judicial system. In fact, I wish as a committee, Mr. Speaker, you had taken time to find ways of also making it possible for judges to declare uh, conflict. I know it is properly stated, oh, state officers and the rest, but it needs to be specific, uh, Mr. Speaker, including uh, mentioning whenever people reach out to them when they are handling certain matters, Mr. Speaker, so that they report and it is known that you cannot uh, do this or the other, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, uh, Mr. Speaker, with those very many remarks, I beg to uh, reply and thank colleagues who have taken time to contribute to this bill. Mr. Speaker, sir, eventually, uh, in accordance to Standing Order Number 66.3, I beg to request that the putting of a question be deferred until a later date. Thank you. Uh, pass one to the standing order 66.3. The putting of the question to this bill is deferred to the next sitting of the Senate. Clerk, you may now call the next order. Order number 13. Motion, declaration of cattle rustling as a, and banditry as a national disaster and establishment of a special fund for victims. Resumption of debate interrupted on Wednesday, 6th March 2024, morning sitting. This uh, motion is deferred to the next sitting. Uh, read the next order, clerk. Order number 14, motion, status of pending bills in counties. Senator Ledamo Lekina, proceed to move this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion. Aware that as of 31st December 2023, according to the county government's budget implementation review report for the first half of the financial year 2023-2024, county governments 
had accumulated a total of Kenya shillings 1.634 billion in pending bills with Nairobi County accumulating the largest share of Kenya shillings 107,037,053 billion followed by Kiambu and Mombasa counties at Kenya shillings 5.7116144412 billion and 3.9221318837 billion respectively concerned that the accumulated pending bills in counties have significantly affected service providers in the counties leading to closure of businesses stalling of county projects adversely affecting economic growth in counties service delivery and ultimately showing slowing down the country's economic growth further concern that most of the service providers in the counties are battling court cases launched against them by their financiers and suppliers while others are languishing in poverty exacerbated by the increased cost of living with increased mental health diseases incidences and other dying as a result of the effects of colossal amount of debt owed to them by county governments now therefore the Senate recommends that all county governments pay verified pending bills amounting to less than 1 billion shillings by the end of the financial year and those above 1 billion by the end of the financial year 2024-2025 and resolve that pass on to the provisions of Regulation 41, 2 and 3 of the Public Finance Management Act, County Government Regulation 2015 County governments prioritize payment of pending bills as a first charge of the county. Revenue fund, failure to which the subsequent quarter's budget releases will not be done. Number two, county governments shall only pay pending bills contained in their respective procurement plans, pursuant to regulation 52 and 3 of the public finance management county government's regulations. Number three, Supplementary budgets for the county governments are prepared in the third quarter to curb instances of arbitrary reallocations out of the approved budget estimates. And four, county government shall conduct public participation while formulating supplementary budgets, failure to which the controller budget shall not approve the supplementary budget. Mr. Speaker, today, one lawyer in Kenya instructed auctioneers to go and attach Nairobi County vehicles. And this is after a ruling by Justice Sifuna, which essentially removed the privilege that governments enjoyed, which was in the civil procedures rule. I think it was rule 16 and Rule 30, 131, which essentially meant that if you are owed money by a county government, the only way that you can be able to get your money is simply when you bribe. And in most cases, Mr. Speaker, if you attempted to follow the due, course, the due process of the law, the only time you can actually be able to get some redress is if you go to court three times, Mr. Speaker. The first time you'll go, you'll get a decree. You'll get orders of mandamus. And then now, after that, you will now pursue that officer to enforce, to be able to have him arrested, a court, uh, you know, a contempt of court for you to get your money. And even after, Mr. Speaker, you do not get the money. Mr. Speaker, earlier on, before coming to move this, I circulated how much each county is owed or rather each county owes to suppliers. Mr. Speaker, Machakos County, which is number four in the list, owes about three billion shillings. In fact, the actual figure is 3.03133471. Mandera County owes another three billion. Busia County 